I went to satellite TV for a little bit, but the rest of the room was fine. So we were just like, man, we want the spikes. We, you know, we want it. And then they came over like, we're like, we're just going to check out a day early. And they gave us our money back for that night and a voucher for a free night. So that was cool. So instead of staying free, we only wanted to stay at two, but it was still, yeah. it was still awesome. You guys got to travel around a little bit. Uh-huh. Look at all the... There are three sheets. Okay. This is the extraction special use permit. I had a pen right here for me. Okay. And this is over here. That's the arrowhead zoning. And that's the arrowhead. Um, that's what I ran for council. Councilwoman Spear was gracious enough to have that, that on her donkey. That was when she ran against you. Oh, that fun one? No, that was small. That was the worst three one. But I walked around. I mean, I had this on, like, at some of the things with, um, it was on my donkey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, good memories. He can hang it up or throw it away or I don't care. No way. Welcome everyone to the City Council work session for the City of Evans, September 15th. First item on the agenda is the COVID-19 response update. We'll hear from staff. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the Council. Our bi-weekly update on COVID numbers in Weld County and Evans and any, up, any operational updates that we have. This is our cumulative trend. You can see the blue line is cases are fairly steady in terms of Increasing cases continuing. And, um, this graph compresses the data you saw in the first slide in two weeks. It kind of gives us some uh, helpful kind of trend data in terms of what's happening from week to week. And I just point out that we're in a pattern now, probably for the past four weeks or so, where we're uh, in probably the 100 to 130 uh, new cases per week in Weld County, what this slide shows. Um, and uh, yeah, last week we had 130 new cases. Um, incidence level or that kind of per capita number is one in 74 at this point uh, for all of Weld County. And the fatalities, Weld County have gone up by just a couple uh, to 96. And the 80620 zip code, which is a relative proxy for Evans. Uh, you can see that we have 12 new cases, kind of a similar percentage increase in the county. Um, incidence level in that zip code, in our Evans zip code is 1 in 58 at this point, um, which is a little higher, in that case it's a little better than the overall really Evans Garden City per capita rate of 1 in 50 at a positive so, um, with that, things are so from a number standpoint, things are fairly steady. Operational news you may have all heard that the governor's public health order was extended regarding masks, it was extended to 
October 12th for masks to be worn, women out who be allowed to, uh, indoors in public. Um, not there's no change there for our operations. I did want to point out one area that has been particularly impacted for us as council is aware of these numbers. Recreation activity um, in August total for the use of the rec center, which would be an exercise we secured this building with a total of 406 for the month. And we had 25 participants in our summer sports. We're well into our fall sports now. We had 167 participants, and that's in several different sports. So those, I believe, have about 50 each, which is giving us a good level for learning and also for some competition. So, Mayor, that's all I have. That concludes staff. Thank you, Jim. Councilman O'Neill. Um, I noticed that uh, at the beginning we had a large village park. I can tell you that the city is not issuing a permits for park facilities now. So those would be ad hoc groups gathering. Um, you know, our police department, I know, you know, when they patrol, when they see large groups that are not uh, distance, they will approach the groups and let them know just what the rules are. Um, but we, you know, we are really, you know, like we have been taking more of an additional approach, right? Just certainly, you know, if you have further questions, I think Chief Grant is here to speak to the direction there. That's our overall I believe all of those considerations are part of our approach, music and gathering that part. Councilwoman Spear? Um, I had a concerned citizen um, that didn't know who to contact. They felt that there was a, um, a COVID hotspot um, in the city. And I just wanted to know what our procedure is for that, because I basically told this person, if you were concerned that you needed to call the health department. So what would you suggest that we would we do with this? First year, you have the right approach. Okay. The health department is the, they do coordinate any kind of medical condition response. I mean, they would, you know, do what they need to more about that. Okay. I just felt bad. I didn't want them uh, feeling like we were negligent or, re you know, responsible for this. So, like I said, I, I directed them um, to the health department. So, thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh -huh. Thank you, Jim. Next item on the agenda is the 2021 budget overview. Here from staff. <laughs> What do you mean? Um, so as we as we begin tonight, this, this is our uh, our budget our budget first session where staff will, uh, will present an overview of the recommended 2021 budget. 
Um, this is, as I, you know, the work session, and we have this kind of this overview presentation that highlights our recommended strategies, our goals, and what this budget will accomplish, um, and what it means for our, our financial health as a city. Um, at your October, your October fifth meeting, um, we'll have you know the budget for your consideration. At, at that point, we'll, we'll have budget documents in detail. We'll have all of that information. Um, so as will the public, all of that will be on the website. Uh, tonight is the strategy approach. Talking about the general fund, we'll also cover uh, briefly the enterprise funds. Um, council update on our non-operating fund revenues. Uh, we had an extensive, for the benefit of the public, we had an extensive work session on our capital plan. Um, as council will, will recall, uh, we will have just a high-level overview of that tonight, and then we'll talk about our, our next step. Well, so I think, you know, the, the theme that you'll hear tonight recurring is uncertainty. You know, Evans, uh, like the rest of Colorado and the world, is dealing with the financial fallout from the COVID-19 circumstances that we all face. <coughs> um, and in Evans, particularly, but Northern Colorado certainly, generally, is has been has been affected by the oil and gas recession that is, you know, I believe, as serious long term um, as the COVID crisis for us. And um, you'll see through our, our revenues and I think the caution in our expenditure plan that we're uh, recommending tonight um, that both of those incidents are really affecting our budget and our financial outlook um, and are giving us a lot of challenges and are presenting a lot of uncertainty. Um, so I'll start with the end here by talking about our approach. We're recommending two steps. For this budget, given the uncertainty that we face, um, we are recommending a, we'll share our revenue estimates for next year and our resulting budget gap. And you'll hear that our budget gap um, to close it completely would require um, significantly deep cuts that would have significant consequences for some of our most basic services, speaking of police and public works and those, those services particularly, but really potentially devastating consequences. Um, so you'll hear an approach tonight that recommends that we make very significant reductions toward that budget gap, uh, but stop just short of compromising those basic services. And that we then kind of ride out more of this COVID period, the next few months of uh, economic experience that we'll have, and go back to council in April, with a reconciliation of how we finish this year, what's happening into the new year, and be prepared to make further adjustments to the budget. What those might be, you know, more reductions, but if things are a little better than we expect now, might be uh, lightening up on some of the measures we're recommending tonight and getting us back on track. So um, that's the that's the strategy that you'll will be hearing. Uh, we will be talking about a budget gap equaling $1.6 million in our general fund, which is approximately 10% of our budget. So that gives you a kind of order of magnitude for what we're facing. As I mentioned, we're recommending that we preserve basic services um, to the extent we can until more of the kind of end game for the COVID crisis is over. Um, you'll be hearing our approach tonight will be to make get about two thirds of the way toward that 1.6 million um, with cuts. And you'll hear about reductions in supplies and services budgets, contract services, um, our need to freeze vacancies, and also our need to, to uh, suspend our merit raise program for employees, uh, given the caution that I feel we need, that we feel we need going into next year's budget. Uh, that'll get us $1.1 million of the way. Uh, we're also then recommending that council endorse an approach where we understand that we could need to use up to half a million dollars of our 
reserves, our fund balance, as we go into next year, um, you know, so that we're able to cover losses that may look like the economy that you know may be that may be conservative but may be appropriate. Um, as we kind of see how all this goes, and we come back to you in April to make those adjustments. So that's kind of the big picture where I think we're going uh, policy-wise, and Jackie will now review uh, in more uh, detail the revenues, which are the basis for the budget, and we'll talk about our, our uh, expenditure plan in some more detail. All right, first, the general fund overview. Graphic here, you can see over an eight year time frame where our general fund revenues have been. You'll notice 2018, 2019, we're at about $15.2 million. Start 2020, very strong. We talked a few times about a strong sales tax revenue in the first quarter of this year, but more economic hardship started to affect the city. That will carry us a little ways into this year. Next year's budget, there is a, the blue cash, doesn't have that starting in first quarter so strong as we had this year. So we will continue to see the revenue budget through 2021 before we then start some recovery. You'll notice from you know, 2019, so it's a 20% reduction in revenue. So pretty big reductions that are set as kind of our new baseline of before we start to climb out of that. Coming in just on the sales tax revenues for the general fund, again, you can see here we were almost to about $9 million. There was a decrease in that was the first year that we pulled it out. The sales tax on food for home consumption started to account for it in its own fund separate from the general fund. There was really no decrease in 1990. In 2020, we project to be just over $7 million in general fund sales tax. Again, 2021, a slight reduction from that level, while we anticipate some entirely uh, reduced activity or heightened restriction. Cash line, so audit recovery. Budget for every single revenue and for every time you are being accepted. Also, with general fund sales tax by category of the sales tax payers. So, across the board, we do again significant. In that first quarter of 2021, the remainder will be leveled out to what we're currently seeing in this part of 2020 for recovery from there. Our base categories, we anticipate up to 15% reduction before it recovers about 2% each month. Our industrial, we heard loud and clear from the council, we do not rely on that money in our operating budget. We strip that down to about 10% of what we do. Um, at about $100,000 this year. We anticipate deep reductions in our storefront category as well, about 10%. And restaurants, fortunately, even deeper. So be 25% we understand that we have challenges ahead in the winter months. One to anticipate categories of flat or what we see currently after the first quarter of decline for fiscal reductions is also a very large tax revenue line for us. We anticipate up to a 25% reduction in that category as well before recovery of about four. Uh, we're asked to also fairly consistently uh, how we budget for the sales tax that we receive from. Exactly. There are a number of other major revenues that the general fund does receive that first Monday of the year. Also, um, equally as important as property tax, even though it's a smaller number, it does fluctuate a fair amount. You'll notice in 2018, that was the first year that the city recognized that there was a gap for the production value as well as infrastructure in the city. We anticipate uh, a decrease this year in property tax in our preliminary assessment. About 630 will have that number just came in from County. You'll notice in the, so the average years for property tax, that number is similar to the 2018 level. For 
getting back to a point where property taxes will also be stripped as, as an additional revenue from oil, gas, and street at the point of residential property tax. Other taxes with pretty large revenue there, it is predominantly looking from an estimated development coming in next year. There are a number of revenues that we talked about that are developed and related. Just know that these projects are all things that we need. So if there is a building permit fee, which is the next county uh, in the line, or in one of the various impact fees funds, look at the number of units in the estimated here. Only an estimated about 50% of those. Governmental is where the sales tax something. You'll notice charges for service and fines for more service. Also significant reduction in those um, from the state order, the stay at home order this year. Uh, the decrease is obviously more operation to give a number of We'll talk some more here later as well, but our recreation center largely is active with revenues. Our recreation CEO. Total revenues for the general fund there is about just shy of thirteen million dollars. A graph that we looked at before, it will take us a number of years as we climb back out of it. The five-year um, view, not quite back to that twenty eighteen budget, especially with some of the like as of today. Hopefully, as you mentioned. Having stronger revenues in our years will show that as well, but it will take a number of years. This one illustrates the budget gap that Jim mentioned. When we first talked about the challenges we were facing, so despite the extent of the revenue decrease that we were as of right now, we anticipate our budget gap being about $2.3 million. We have identified the introduction. Meaning that we have gained use of fund balance of $793,000 for this. I'll be going to talk about that number being wide array of differences there. Um, but from what we know today and what our sales tax from the rest of this year, so that would mean our ending fund balance would be about $10.7 million. Uh, we'll talk about it more in a few other slides too, but as you mentioned, our current anticipated budget gap, 2021 budget is about $1.6 million. One of demand reduction and that. Up here, talk a little bit about the recommended service reductions and budget, <coughs> budget reductions in our various operations. As we said, this is premised on the approach of uh, making as many reductions as we can uh, without compromising those basic services to the public at this point until we know where things are going to go. And uh, you'll see that we're going to do that and find about 1.1 million savings really in three ways. And that's looking at all of the supplies and services, contract services that we have, and questioning if we can reduce those, which we are in most cases. Um, we're holding positions that are vacant now, vacant for next year, and we'll, we'll continue to evaluate those and likely hold additional positions vacant if we can. Um, I will be only um, authorizing recruitments if we feel that the positions are critical for those basic services like police or, for instance, snow removal this, this coming year. Uh, we had to fill one more there just to make sure that we could round out our, our uh, snow plowing operations. But uh, freezing as many vacancies, frankly, as we can while keeping services going so that we can hold that savings until we know what we can afford. And finally, as we said, suspending our merit raise uh, program for, for employees. This slide just shows some of the numbers associated with those given strategies, call your attention to the first numbers column on the left, because that shows the 
reduction percentages assigned to each department or cluster, we're calling them, of departments. We looked at some departments that can kind of be grouped together for purposes of their services. Um, and we worked on a kind of core cooperative basis among those different departments to find, to, to uh, achieve those savings targets. But just to call your eye to kind of the overall strategy, we scaled the reductions to what I would say are the kind of the, the critical nature of the services. So for instance, what, I, what we believe are the most critical to, you know, to our sustainability as a community are our public safety and infrastructure service, police and public works. And we assign 5% targets to those departments for their supply of services. Then we looked at our community development, our economic development services, and also all of our all of our administrative services, which of course are needed to support those most core services, and assign those a 10% supplies and services target. And finally, we had our, our recreation services, which um, is very much a part of the quality of life that we believe Evans is about but it's also been the most impacted, impacted by our COVID circumstances. Jackie mentioned that we've reduced the revenue projections for recreation fees by about 50%. So, because we just, that's just based on, on projected activity at this time. But you'll see that we're uh, reducing the budgets for supplies and services in that area by 25%. Uh, because we think it's probably appropriate and prudent given that, that reduced level of activity uh, for recreation this year and into the first part of next year. And then next to that, you'll see what that translates to in terms of supplies and services budget numbers, uh, reductions. The next column is our, uh, our vacant positions. You'll see those listed on the far right side of the slide. You can see positions that are, are being held vacant. Um, talk in a couple minutes about what some of those are. Um, and then you'll see the strategy for the uh, holding our, our current salaries so or suspending that merit program. You can see that by doing that, we can save uh, just over, two, over $200,000 uh, going into next year. So that's how the $1.1 million of strategies at, at this point is comprised. Next slide, we'll highlight a couple of the service implications. As I mentioned, we're trying to preserve our, our, most ba our, our basic services, and this plan you saw will hold two police officers vacant, but those are the two spots that council authorized as new officer spots for 2020. We haven't filled those spots. We have planned that those would help us, particularly with our, our traffic enforcement. We weren't able to fill them due to what we encountered this year with budget. So holding those two will still allow police to operate at their, their effective force of 36 sworn officers, which is their historic level uh, for at least the past several years. Um, also good news I'll mention is that we've had up to five police officer spots this year in uh, the academy or training, I believe that's the number of close. And uh, those officers are coming out of their training programs now and are being able to work independently um, in the community. So even at this, this level, the, the police department right now is feeling a little more breath um, through their own, through their, their authorized resources. So that's a good thing. Uh, Streamings. Very high priority of this, this council. We've had we kept that at the six hundred thousand dollars of uh, general fund support, street maintenance, um, parks and mowing services. That's also been a priority. Here's an, uh, another area where we had added a, a spot for this year, um, actually actually two, and we're having to hold one hold one of those vacant, and also we're holding a, a street operation spot vacant and about half of our seasonal mowing um, so that we can capture that, that savings. Again, we're, we don't want to fill those spots. We're not going to be able to afford them later next year, but still keep our current service level 
uh, continuing for parks support and operations. Finally, economic development, we have uh, two positions in that area, one full-time, one part-time. Uh, we have the, the part-time position vacant. That is challenging our, we're holding that position vacant. It is challenging our, our ability to engage our businesses quite to the level that we have, uh, but we feel that that's probably a, a prudent um, position to hold vacant now, given our circumstances. Can I ask for a clarification before we move on? Yes. About the police services. Okay, can you explain this to me again? There's five individuals going through the academy now or who are graduating from the academy. Are they going to be Evans police employees? So that's 38 plus five or that's 38 total with them? The, the 36 includes those Evans trainees who are okay. going through the academy and have been in what we call the field training office, field training yeah. FTO program. Uh, so they've been training now. At, since the, the academy, they've been training with our officers. So that's a, a, a very significant resource dedication for both those those trainees and the officers training them. Okay. So now that they're emerging from their training and they're able to act independently, it gives us significantly more resource uh, within our 36 authorized. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I want to spend a minute on on uh, recreation because we uh, talked about how that's definitely the largest reduction in this year's budget. I want to start with an important assumption that is kind of the basis for this recommendation, and that is that the COVID restrictions we're assuming will see some sort of loosening after the first quarter as we get through the winter and spring and summer of next year. Um, I'm certainly not going to bet my lunch on vaccines or anything like that, but for just for clarity, this budget is assuming that uh, we will be able to resume more normal recreation activities uh, into the middle of middle and, and, uh, and later parts of next year. Um, that's the reason that it's important that we retain a core of our, our full-time staff. We we had three uh, up till early this year, and as, as Council is aware, the, the former director. Uh, separated from the city. We did some, re some reorganizing there. We have not filled the third full-time uh, position, and I'm not recommending that we do so. Uh, but it's important that we have our two full-timers um, to continue as they've been working hard to adapt to the state rules for recreation facilities, keeping in touch with all of our client families, supporting the programs that are going on, keeping all of our staff, our part-time staff, and most you know, not been working, um, keeping them apprised of, what, of what's happening. It's important that we keep those those folks um, as a core so that when we're ready to reemerge from this time, we can do so strongly back into our kind of full programming. So that's why you're seeing us, uh, us <coughs> recommend, recommend that, that staffing core. Um, but I do want to just hit on a couple of the uh, components of how we're saving that kind of money. As I mentioned, we're, uh, we're holding one, one admin position vacant. Um, the rec center of, uh, programs have continued with much shorter hours, fewer staff, uh, so we're saving significant funds on our, our part-time staff. We're making our equipment last longer. Um, senior pro programs have seen a major decrease, of course, and naturally in activity. Um, we are not having any travel or any extensive senior programming until further COVID restrictions are uh, reduced or eliminated. And then, of course, our Riverside Library um, and, and <coughs> social center events have been very few, if, if any. Um, we're not spending what we have on maintenance and um, so those costs for the whole facility have been, been lower. So that's, those are kind of the, the high or low points of uh, how we're saving that 26%. Last point on recreation, I'll just mention that while this has been most impacted, we believe that it's also probably the most resilient, where we know that if we're seeing the activity numbers and program participants coming back to, say, a historic level, um, we feel confident that we can bring that, that those revenue projections 
back to council and would probably have some authorization of the staff needed to, to support those those programs if the revenues there to, to support so that is our, our summary of recreation as we look citywide at personnel cost changes you'll see our current year <coughs> personnel budget about 11.3 million dollars numbers we had looked at previously have been by savings from holding vacant positions about seven hundred five thousand dollars the suspension of the merit program for next year would result in savings of about two hundred fifty thousand. for a total reduction in payroll costs of nine hundred fifty four thousand or eight percent that would bring our next year's total citywide personnel budget to about On the supply and services side, Jim highlighted some of the divisions and what their respective reductions uh, reflect the 5, 10, and 25 percent levels were. What that means for a 2020 budget is a general fund, what we call incident supply and services, of about $4.4 billion. Dollars. So that is 7.5 percent more than what we project spending this year. Supply and services is a little bit less for next year's budget than what we're seeing right now. Our gap, our gap is reduced by more than two thirds, as you mentioned. Uh, 1.6 million dollar gap in our next year's budget. That column in the middle there shows we had no claim reduction. That would draw down our ending fund balance to about 9.1 million dollars. We're identifying our work. But we are. You'll see the plan reductions of 1.1 million dollars resulting in that plan. A couple of times already, but that ending fund balance would be about $10.2 million. All of those plan reductions. We do often look at what that looks like when we talk about our reserves and our ending fund balance and what that means to the money we're holding for different purposes. Now, by policy set, 50% of the prior year. Otherwise, identify what that could be. Some economic downturn we are currently in. A major sales tax generator loss is not a major business investment at a short time period. We would need to cover that revenue flow readjusted. Uh, heaven forbid we have a natural disaster, uh, there would be some money there to help us. Uh, start to provide recovery as well as development or investment. What you'll notice in that yellow is we do still have a $2.7 million dollars in next year's budget, above and beyond that specific level set at home by policy. So, us expecting usage of half a million dollars of our balance uh, doesn't touch any of that 50% that we set aside in our. Here shows the five year plan. Oftentimes, look back to what we call our long range plan. Always in our budget, recommend that something new for our budget is sustainable. Historically, when we bring a budget to you at this time of year, not only balance for the current or for the next year, but also in those years out. As Jim mentioned, there is so much economic uncertainty that we face, so many assumptions on assumptions. What we're projecting for next year is small amount of fund balance it does provide us that time to anticipate how far we need to cut, if this is far enough, if it's too far, uh, so that when we come back in the first quarter of next year, we'll re look at it in the five year plan. Our committee that as it goes on for in recovery, hopefully soon. <laughs> We will, uh, for future years, balance that budget year by year and look at a plan to tackle that budget gap in our community. What's that point you said? Uh, understand that the underscore. This is just listed, uh, this is one of those like the 2021 budget. 
as presented, but as Jackson said, uh, part of that reconciliation in next year's mid-year budget process will to will be to address that you know more of that uh, net results negative line, that ongoing budget gap, um, so that we do not plan to spend down that uh, fund balance. This is just an illustration of the, the long-term five-year implications of this presented budget. I'll show you what that would look like. That blue line there is without reduction. So the negative number of ending uh, or budget gap that you saw on the previous slide each year. If we did nothing, um, that's how quickly our fund balance would be drawn down. That yellow line is the recommended reduction from 2020. That would mean for the retirement. That green line there shows our commitment to have um, now and showing that we would continue to keep our ending fund balance consistent with that. On to some of the archives and funds, but you want to pop here and take our questions on. There are questions about the general fund could apply to the board. Okay. Anybody have questions up to this point? At this uh -huh. point. I do, I do just want to say something that's relative to the general fund. I think it's important for both council and the public to understand. So when we're looking at a general fund reserve and a reserve fund policy, I think a lot of times um, when I'm talking to constituents or anybody, people often question why do you have this much in reserve or um, why aren't you just using it? You have 2.7 million in excess of reserve, why not just use that? But I think it's incredibly important for people to understand that maintaining a reserve is just as important as having it because in years such as this, we have the ability to have a short-term solution. So those reserves really help us to deliver financial stability in a really unstable time. Um, and I think that's super important. So if we look at those long-range projections, over the next five years, assuming things didn't recover as anticipated, we could potentially see the need to use more than $3 million in fund balance. Um, and so that, you know, when you take all of those in consideration from 2022 to 2025 onward, that's more than $3.7 million, which would get us below our identified reserves. By utilizing that $500,000, I think what the city and, and Jackie and her team have done such a good job of doing is really allowing us to have a short-term solution with a plan for long-term recovery. And I want people to understand that. The cuts are meant to be temporary um, and they're meant to help the city succeed. If we went through and gouged a bunch of things in an effort to get us to kind of this um, non, to a place where we didn't have to utilize any fund balance, we could be cutting things that are necessary to the success of the city and really to um, be benefiting our residents. And I think that's really important but I also think it's truly important for people to understand why we don't swing so far the other way. And I just really wanted to highlight that because I think it's incredibly important for the staff, the council, and our residents to truly understand how important that balance is. And I just really appreciate the work that went into this from a uh, staff's <coughs> perspective, and I think the approach is, is great. So thank you for that. Councilwoman Spear? I just want to say <clears throat> thank you for that uh, <clears throat> that uh, point there, um, Councilwoman Castle. Um, it's very well said and we're very well put, much more eloquent than what I'm probably going to say. Um, I just wanted to <clears throat> express appreciation for the staff for a couple of things. Number one, uh, really looking into the budget and making these cuts where we needed to without totally scalping uh, the city and the services that we provide. Um, on that note, um, one of the things that you guys uh, had have in here is a freezing of some of the um, uh, the bonuses and, and maybe the raises and also the hiring, which I think is very important um, to let you all know that as a business owner myself, and I know that Mayor Rudy is also a business person, that we are all going through some tough economic times. And I think it's a very hard decision to make. And, you know, you have to weigh you know, making these cuts and balancing things out and not giving raises or giving bonuses with keeping the staff. And I think that, um, you know, I just want to show, I just want to voice my appreciation for um, everybody coming together and making these hard choices 
and um, I hope that we uh, I hope that we express how valuable we think the staff is and the city is for making these um, making these changes and hopefully it's a short term um, solution um, and I just wanted to take this time to express my gratitude for that and hopefully I think the rest of the council um, might be as, as gracious too. Um, I, I know we've got a, more of a budget um, uh, <clears throat> presentation, so I, and just in case this didn't come out at the end, mm -hmm. we didn't have time. I do wanted to uh, make sure that the staff and all of the staff from up, up top to the very bottom um, knows that we're all kind of grinding our daily lives down to what we have to do at this point in time, and hopefully we can all just get through this together and we'll come out better in the long run, I hope. Thank you. Thanks for listening to us, too, about where we wanted the cuts, too. Anyone else? I'll reserve mine till the end. I will. We'll get on the enterprise bus in the next few slides. So one of our larger enterprise funds. From a revenue perspective, our initial budget does have a base rate increase. Our reward and um, that process still needs to be discussed in a couple of forums as well. Um, for this year, like older, for <laughs> sure. Um, but that is included in the senior fee, but it is not approved. But adjustments, as always, we strive to fund major maintenance at the Thank you. Thank you. On the expense side in the waterfront, while well, really is also in their budget process, they have told us to look narrowly. So we have also built that in, uh, knowing that that need will have come as well. So it'll be both 2020 and 2021 increases. Exciting change to our fund or addition is our conservation efforts. Is our seed money, and 
for both replacement of our existing facilities and really the, the, the lion's share of it will be the seed money for the, the future expansion the council's aware of that we'll, we'll finalize some more analysis on what those costs might be but um, much of that fund balance will be needed for that for those projects Development impact to keep us in from the beginning that we are anticipating about 50% of our anticipated have calculated to be very different. So a little over $2 million. Um, and then we'll highlight quickly just our asset management plan. Jim mentioned that our creation is trying to be on the equipment. There is a treadmill that is no longer able to be uh, revived, so there is one piece of equipment that needs to be in place next year. I said our aging group, while we had hoped to be able to, like they would still continue to be strong and healthy, so we will. So all of the asset management items in the three budgets we fall in the general fund. Um, there is no 
both models that we'll go over these. We did talk about um, all of the enterprise funds, so those are not just everything else we have in the parking tax funding project at the two parking companies. <coughs> You'll see over a few of the street projects, uh, our street fund summit is 37th Street Widening, so it was the street impact fund, our PIC street fund, um, the road tax fund, the food tax fund. We're really trying to bridge all of those funds together in various courses. Also in the food tax fund, we have design and construction of the parking lot here. Conservation trust fund. There's also uh, landscape planning on 37th Street in the park on the south side of 37th Street. And there's also still an overlay at the same time. Um, that we're keeping will be up to 37th Street. Our every other year process to continue with the As well as at the bottom there, the road tax. Incorporate an additional $1.1 million. Half of that money. That would mean almost one point eight million dollars total for street for street. Okay. Um, so I wanted to just show capital expenditures by year. It's kind of interesting to look at what areas these capital projects have fallen under. So you'll see from 2015. You'll see the water and sewer projects. So those are yellow are road projects. We did uh, quite a bit done by 2019. At the reconstruction of Riverside Park in 2017, it is in that green, as well as in each year some parking tax and occupation trust projects. Um, and then some other capital expenditures that have been. So next up brings us to next city council. We will have the ordinance and budget book and all the corresponding information that relates to the um, for first reading. So that would um, make the budget official. Again, you know, keep that commitment to as we close out this year, as we get through the first quarter of next year, come back to you with an update in our projections and an update on what we what we see here over the last or the next few months as far as economic conditions, what we face, and hope for the best at that point. Before we finish our comments, I'd just like to uh, thank the staff that are here. Great to see so many of our staff, mostly managers, who have worked really hard on this budget. It's been a hard year, as we all know. Um, a lot of focus on budgets to pull together these reductions and the plan that we have in, in, in such a way that we can keep our our basic services going um, at the, the funding levels that we'll have. Um, budget is truly a, a, a collaborative process. I want to take just a second and thank Jackie for her leadership of this process, her team, her finance team that coordinates with all the departments and all the managers that are part of that uh, process. So, council with that, that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Questions or comments of staff? I have no questions, but I have a comment. Again, as, as Jim just pointed out, another fabulous job on the budget presentation, you know, this year, and as always, that you and your staff put together before council, very detailed, you know, goes through very thoroughly everything. And um, usually when it comes to council for our approval, it's a pretty quick and easy process because everything gets explained so thoroughly. So thank you for that as well. Um, I also want to say, you know, hopefully, 
I know 2021 is going to be a little bit difficult year for, you know, the city. I'm glad we're maintaining the services that we are able to maintain. And we do, unfortunately, have to make some cuts in the budget in that. But we really hope for a quick economic recovery. And uh, this will only hit maybe impact for us for a year. You know, I want to say to the staff, I appreciate all of your hard work and everything that you guys do, um, regardless of what department you work at. Um, you know, you are a valuable asset to the city and the community, and we really thank you. Um, I, I wish, you know, there wasn't some of those hard cuts that had to be made. And, you know, when we could pass along to you a merit raise or a bonus or something that you may normally have been entitled to in, in, in 2021. But uh, we really hope that we get through this together, and uh, hopefully in the following budgets we can make that up to you in some fashion or another. So thank you. I echo the I echo the uh, mayor pro temp's comments, as well as I echo Jim's comments as well. Um, the budget is a collaborative effort. I appreciate everything you all did to come together to make this happen. These are hard decisions and hard choices to make, but it's in the it's with you know the notion that hopefully soon you know we'll have a better year and things will change. So definitely thank you for all your work and all your collaboration. I mean this is definitely a hard situation to put anyone in, but you know all in good spirits. Thank you. Anyone down in front? Mayor Mortensen, Neil. Thank you, guys. Great job. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is attorney chat. We'll turn it over to you, Scott. Smaller than a case file. Thanks, Scott. Is it smaller than a case file? Sometimes we do these things 
almost out of habit, we don't get a lot of thought to why are we doing what we're doing and really understand what it is we're doing. That's the usual do with these very good. It's sort of like when I spit out the language for the uh, executive session of uh, 2644, 2644, we, we don't really think about what that means. So the purpose of this outline is to remind you of some of the things you continue to do. If there are areas that you would like to talk about in future attorney chats, please feel free to let me know. For today's discussion, I want to focus on a fairly narrow uh, topic, which is when is it appropriate for counsel to uh, ask questions appropriate for counsel to have a discussion? And it, it, you know, it sounds pretty simple, but it gets a little bit tricky uh, when you get right down to it. So over on the second page of the outline, I even have the bold and underline. This is where we will focus our discussion today. And um, so there are public meetings and there are public hearings. I mentioned public meetings are when there are three or more of you to get together to talk about policy. The most common public meeting that you have is this meeting. You have them you know, regularly, um, but not all public meetings are public hearings. So, uh, in, on the second page there, I talked about the process for making decisions at public meetings. Not to be confused with public hearings. We'll talk about the difference between public hearings and public meetings in just a moment. But we you know the process that you go through, and you know, you've seen it several times. The mayor introduces an item, you get a staff report, some in the item, and that's the first time that really should think about asking questions. You get a staff report, things that you do, you ask questions and you discuss. When you get a staff report, it's really the first time that you should think about asking questions. Um, in general, I encourage councils to ask clarifying questions, uh, but if you have questions based on the staff report, while well, staff is at the table, it's a good time to ask them. Um, and then public comments. Since this is a, we're talking now about public meetings and not public hearings, public comment is pretty much discretionary for folks, especially the mayor. Uh, the open, a lot of people think that the Sunshine Law, also known as open meetings laws, Mean that the public have a right to participate in every aspect of the meeting, and that's not accurate. They are just that. They are sunshine laws intended to promote transparency so that the public can see what you're doing. It doesn't mean that it entitles the public to participate in everything that you do. But this uh, council, like most, uh, have encouraged public participation, so even though it's not required, we usually entertain public comment on a lot of your items. Um, and that's fine. What I would encourage you to do, though, is if you get public comment related to an item, and that public member is there, again, if you have questions, ask the public there. Um, then um, once you have heard from the comment, the next step, the step five is, is the motion and second. Now, if somebody makes a motion and there's no second, that's the end of it. You go on to the next agenda. If there is a motion and a second, and if, you, if you're not sure if you want a second motion, by seconding a motion, you do not say, I support the motion. All you are saying is, I support that we discuss the motion. You know, and we've got to get past that motion in a second, so you can have really the key focus of what we want to talk about in the next discussion among council. So if you have the motion in a second, then you can answer the council discussion section. What I might encourage you to do is limit your council discussion to the council discussion session, or that section of the process. Um, that's the time to say, this is what I think about the proposal, uh, this is how I intend to vote, this is why I intend to vote. <clears throat> Ask questions among yourselves. If you have a question that comes up during council discussion that you need some source from outside to answer, I would encourage you to direct a fairly pointed question to whoever that is, the applicant, the staff, whoever it was, get your question answered. Then go back to keeping the discussions just at council, uh, council level. Council discussion is not a time for back and forth with the public. It's really for you to work as a collective body and come to a resolution. Um, so after you complete your council discussion, then you should place your vote. And this is where a lot of councils get in trouble is during the vote, it's really only three responses. It's made an error of state. Uh, and some councils tend to get into an explanation of their vote. That 
explanations you want should all happen at the council discussion level. So if you get to voting on the question, it's either yay, nay, or abstain. And that may seem sort of overly picky about things, but it's really not for two reasons. You know, we've got council member A to B that are voting. And council member A and B vote, and we've got a council member C, and council member C says, well, this is how I'm voting, and here's why. Well, council member A and B have already voted. So if you have a really good explanation to support your vote, and they don't get to hear it before you vote, then they've lost that. It's also important for due process considerations because if you especially in quasi-judicial decisions, it's supposed to be a collective decision based on everything that's presented. Well, if a lot of what's presented is not presented until you vote, you know, I'm voting this way and you reply, then the people that voted before you did not base their decision on everything that was presented. And there is actually a due process argument you can make that that's an invalid vote. So, that's why I say it's really important that you have your council discussions during the council discussion part, you get it all out there with all your reasoning, and then when you get to the vote part, just I or nay or so. Um, that's the process if you have a public meeting. Considerations are really very similar to the public hearing. Public hearing is a more formal requirement and usually require some type of a notice before you have the hearing. It's items that relate to a license of some type or uh, a grant of some type of a property interest. Um, you know, if it's a variance or some type of a land use application, then you're more likely to be in the public hearing setting rather than just the public meeting setting. But when you get down to the process, there are more steps involved because, as you'll recall, we are introducing the item. Your staff, it's the time to ask staff questions. Then you hear from the applicant. Well, that's the time to ask the applicant questions. Then you hear from the opponents, which are the supporters of the application. That's the time to ask those questions. And then you hear from the opponents to the application. And that's the time to ask the opponents questions. And then you have some rebuttal, you can ask questions. And you get through all those steps, which, which there were of in the public um, hearing rather than the public meeting. Then the mayor closes. Here, ask for the motion, and then you're kind of back on the same set we just talked about. You know, nobody makes a motion, or if you make a motion and nobody seconds it, you're done, you move on to the next item. Um, but once you get a motion and a second, you move back to that key element of council discussion. And there again, you get it all out during council discussion, you keep council discussion, then vote to your I or nay or something. So that's really the, I think, the, the main focus that I wanted to uh, emphasize today. The only other thing I wanted to mention is one of the last things was this post action fitness council decisions keyboard. And that's really the denoting asset. Uh, my, my objective view is to see a lot of, I know you guys have seen a lot of councils, but this council is very effective uh, because you all uh, feel free to express your, your views. Uh, you don't feel the need necessarily to agree on everything. You seem to respect each other's reasoning for disagreeing. Um, so you, you, a lot of times you come to a consensus. Not that important that you reach a consensus as it is that once you have reached a decision and there's an outcome, you recognize that that is the city council's outcome. So even if you may have voted against something that uh, passes or in order for something that fails, it's important to recognize that city council's decision. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to say, oh, now I agree with it, everything I said was wrong. But it is important to understand that you're a part of a collaborative body. Once you've made that decision, the city council's decision is like, I may not have agreed with the reasons we did it, but it's our decision now, and we become best to get it and the support. Um, that's really all I intended to, to cover tonight. As I said, the outline is there, so if you have questions and want to cover some other areas on the page, you can do that. But I'll be glad to answer any questions. And Thank you. Councilwoman Spear? I have two things. <coughs> Number one, <clears throat> we've been making, uh, we've been having our council discussion, then making the motion, and, and voting immediately. Are you suggesting that we switch that then? Those two are actually interchangeable. 
Okay. If you want to say, let's discuss it. The only reason that some council would like to, to have a motion in a second is because sometimes there's not enough interest in the item to even have a discussion. And so if there's not a motion in a second, and you have your discussion after the motion in a second, then you just kind of avoid the discussion part and go on to the next item. That doesn't happen very often in evidence. So that's why I say, for you, it's okay to put those two items. If you want to have your discussion, you know, the, the contrary view is, well, if we have our discussion, then maybe someone will be interested in making a motion. But as far as what you do during those parts, it doesn't change that at all. If what you say is, you know, before you make a motion, what you say is, I'll open it up to counsel for discussion. The same rules should apply. The discussion should be among counsel unless you need something to answer. What you're saying, I'll make the motion, the motion in a second, and we'll write the vote from there. The vote should still just be I, A, or the same. So my second question is, I noticed you don't have a call to order in here during the discussion. So we're discussing roads and some one of the council members takes it on a tangent and is starting to talk about Star Trek. Um, I mean, we can we can have a call to order on that yeah, discussion ways, then. Yes, yeah, there's a couple ways to do it. One is to just say, you know, all the order in my take the discussion to the subject, which is this. The other is there are certain motions that take precedence. You just, you know, Barbara's rules of order theoretically govern what you do. Um, it's the book, it's this thing. And I really encourage anyone to follow the strict rules. Bob uh, Biden, <laughs> the city attorney for Centennial, followed uh, a short version of Robert's rules of order, which he calls Bob's rules of order. And, and I think they're really pretty well put together. But there, even there, there are certain motions that take precedence. One is a call order to say, you know, general has to bring this back to the discussion. The other is to call the question. You, know, if you are in the midst of a discussion that doesn't seem to be going anywhere, you can call the question, which means the next, the only thing you can do at that point is make a motion in a second. And if it passes, then you go ahead and vote. Um, and that is just to put an end to what seems like maybe not off off of today, but it just sort of seem to be in sort of okay. Thank you. Other questions of Scott or comments? No. Okay. Thanks, Scott, for doing this. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is <coughs> excuse me, council discussion. I know Council Member Neal, you have something you'd like to talk about? Yes, I uh, would like to tell the council about a, a day about two weeks ago uh, after the weather guessers had been uh, promoting uh, the snowstorm uh, one of my neighbors caught me and uh, asked me he meant, uh, why when they put out something in the water bill about starting the road in August that nothing had been done and um, that the uh, snow was going to fly and when, when were we going to be working on 37th Street. I went to lunch and I walked in the restaurant and they, uh, the cashier hit me with the same basic thing, the weather's changing, why haven't you started on the road? Um, moved to another part of the restaurant, a second person uh, caught me and asked me basically the same question, but they also mentioned, since they're a resident of Evans, the insert in the water bill. Uh, a third person overheard this conversation and uh, caught me and, and talked to me about the same situation. So I'm very concerned that uh, we, uh, if this road is somehow delayed and not completed before spring, that we will be losing the support of our citizenry that we have worked so hard to gain uh, to get the sales tax for the roads passed. 
So I just wanted to express this concern, and I don't know whether any of the other council members have experienced anything like this, but if you have, I'd certainly uh, like to hear about it. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member Neal. Jim, did you want to respond to the timing on that? I, to me, I drove down 37th Street on the way here. It looks like they got a heck of a start going on it. So yeah. I think they're moving along. Thankfully, they do, Mayor. Uh, we're very you know, <clears throat> glad now that the project is underway. We've been working with our contractors since we awarded the contract in late August on their uh, schedule for the uh, project. They are uh, confident that they can bring the resources needed to complete the project on time. Um, and they so far have uh, demonstrated that they are on track. It's only a couple weeks into it now. Um, but we, as some council knows, we do have full-time, uh, very qualified project management, really following that schedule on a daily basis with the contractors. And um, at, at this point, we're on track. And we are, uh, looking forward to 37th Street being uh, completed and looking much better than it has. Thank you, Jim. Anyone else for council discussion? I just have a couple side notes I'd like to make. One, I would like to wish Council Member Spear happy 33rd birthday. I hope it was fantastic for you this weekend. <laughs> and second, Councilwoman Johnson, I saw your letter that you got from the governor um, joining his task task force. Is that the right term? Council. Council. Um, while there is not very much I agree with the governor on, there's one thing I agree with him on a lot, and that is how good of a person you are and how good you will do on any council you're on. So congratulations for your appointment to that council. It's fantastic. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So, I do not have anything else. All right, we'll take a 12-minute break, and we'll get started. Thank you. Now you're on. Welcome everyone to the City of Evan City Council meeting for September 15th, 2020. My name is Brian Rudy. I'm the mayor. We'll call the meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mayor Rudy. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Clark. Here. Council Member Spear. Here. Council Member Johnson. Present. Council Member Neal. Present. Council Member Castle. Here. Council Member Mortensen. Here. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a proclamation for Hispanic Heritage Month. Before I get started with that, I'd like to turn it over to Councilwoman Johnson. So today is a monumental and historic day because with the, I have the help, well, I should say, I spearheaded with the help of the mayor, council, and staff, the first Hispanic Heritage Month proclamation. As, <laughs> as an Evan City Council member, I am helping to recognize the achievements and the contributions and the voices of the Hispanic community that I am a part of. Thank you to everyone who is here today experiencing this moment with us. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Declaring September 15th through October 15th, 2020 as Hispanic Heritage Month in the city of Evans, Colorado. Whereas the celebration of Hispanic Heritage Week, now expanded to Hispanic Heritage Month, was established in 1968 to recognize and celebrate the heritage and culture of Latinos, Latinas in the United States, while highlighting Latinx economic, cultural, and creative contributions to our nation. And whereas September 15th is the anniversary of independence for the Latin American countries of Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, while Mexico and Chile separate, uh, celebrate their respective Independence Days on September 16th and September 18th. And whereas many other Latin American countries celebrate Dia de la, la Raza, a celebration of Hispanic heritage, on October 12th, and whereas the United States Census Bureau estimates the Hispanic population in the United States to be over 60 million people, making Hispanic Americans 18.5% of the population and the largest racial or ethnic minority group in the United States. 
And whereas Evans' Hispanic population comprises an estimated 44% of all residents with a labor force participation rate of 66.1%. And whereas there are more than 4.7 million Hispanic-owned firms in the United States, providing over 3 million jobs and contributing more than 500 billion to the United States economy. And whereas the Hispanic community is active in all units of local, state, and federal government, from volunteer boards and commissions to civilian employment to elected offices, and among the more than 1 million Hispanics that have served or are currently serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. Now, therefore, I, Brian Rudy, Mayor of the City of Evans, do hereby proclaim September 15th through October 15th as Hispanic Heritage Month in the City of Evans and encourage the people of Edison of Evans to observe Hispanic Heritage Month with programs and activities that will continue to celebrate the contributions of Latinas and Latinos to our life in the United States. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused to be the, fixed, the official seal of the city of Evans, Colorado, this 15th day of September 2020. And I am going to ask Councilmember Johnson to come back and present this to our specially, special guests. And can we please have uh, Stacey Zuniga with the Latino Coalition of Wells County to accept this on behalf of our Hispanic community? Yeah, uh, push the little button in the middle. If it's red, you're good to go. Oh. Mm -hmm. I'm up a little bit of mess. Uh, I'll try to pull it down and speak up a little bit. On behalf of the Latino Coalition of Rome County, the Evans and Colorado Hispanic community, I'd like to express a heartfelt thank you to the Evans City Council and to the city of Evans for this proclamation to honor Hispanic heritage, who we are as a people. Traditionally, Hispanics celebrate who they are, where they come from, not only in a geographical sense, but proudly who we are in lineage and ancestry. Holidays are provided within the culture to do just that. In this tradition, we hand down honor and respect for not only where we come from, but also from who generation after generation. This proclamation today joins the entire city of Evans in this celebration and connects us intimately with the residents who are part of our daily lives. Whether we have just arrived in this community or have family roots that greeted early settlers, we are proud to be a part of the Evans community. And I speak for Hispanics like myself who own property in this city. For the workforce, the 66% workforce who, who come and, and put the food on their tables for their families because of a job in Evans. And I speak for those who own and operate small business businesses and the 44% of the Evans Hispanic population who call this city their home. I'm honored to be the first person to receive this valuable proclamation. And I receive it with a full and a humble heart. Thank you for this unforgettable act of inclusion and community. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Next item on the agenda is audience participation. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address City Council on any item that is not on the agenda this evening? Please come up to the podium, state your name and address. Thank you for being here. Well, it's that time of year again. Um, 
Thank you for letting me have just a few minutes of your time. Once again, I am Nancy Critchfield, and I have with me Ken Knudsen. Ken is the past president of the Exchange Club of Greeley, and I'm the president-elect. And we are getting started on bringing for the fourth year wreaths across America to the Evans Cemetery. And wow, what a year this past seven months have been. I doubt that there is anyone who has not been affected in some way by this COVID pandemic. Despite this, our club is committed to honoring our veterans in our community who have passed. We work closely with the people who bring the program to Lynn Grove in Greeley and in Eaton. And at this time, we're not quite sure of the status of Sunset Memorial Gardens. We're hoping it will happen. The mission is to remember, honor, and teach, which is why what we try to show as we fundraise for the Reese and talk to members of our community and schools. Not sure we'll be able to get in the schools, but we're going to try to reach out to the teachers if at all possible. Our program is December 19th. It will be at 10 o'clock. And the one thing that I'm most concerned about and wanted to address with you is that I want to make sure that I follow the state and county public health orders and that uh, that might be in place at that time. It's already been decided that we will not have the full program um, that we've had in the past. We do have the Civil Air Patrol cadets doing the color guard for us because that is our student part of the program. Um, we will also hopefully find a student who will sing the national anthem for us. And then we'll do the wreath presentation by the VFW for each branch of service. Our bugler will pay, play taps, and then we're going to be asking for um, help at placing the wreath. So 10, 15 minutes of a program. Um, there won't be chairs, and we're going to encourage people to stand apart. Um, we hope that this will meet the current guidelines and will adjust as needed. If there are ever any concerns as the time gets closer, please reach out to me, and I'll be happy to work with bringing it safely to the cemetery. Um, Mayor, I, you're good at proclamations. I would love to still have a proclamation for that day. If possible, we might try to read it maybe at a different time. I'm not sure how it's all going to fall together. I'll absolutely do whatever you ask. Yes. Thank you. Our club has had to make many cuts in our budget since we were unable to have either of our major fundraising. Um, but we want you to know that the money that we do raise only goes for Reese. We don't take any of that money. Every dime goes to our veterans. Um, so the one thing we are doing is asking, as always, for your help in getting the word out. I have some pins that I purchased, and I think Ken's been purchased, um, passing them around, that say Reese Across America. And I'm asking if when you are out in the community, if you would wear them, and if anybody asks about it, <laughs> prime time there. Um, direct them to the website, which is reeseacrossamerica.org. Um, I also have a, a couple little cards, and they do have my phone number on, and I will be happy to talk to anybody about Reese at any time. Um, we do have uh, the Greeley Tribune is giving us some great advertising, and Pirate Radio, uh, we paid them to do some promotions for us. But other than that, it's going to be up to us to find people willing to donate the $15 for the purchase of each wreath. And as you know, right now, I haven't heard since May, but we're still at 189 veterans buried at Evans. Um, if you know of a business or if you have a business or if you know of somebody that would be willing to hang a poster, give me a call that has our information on it, and I will deliver it. <laughs> so uh, anyway, thank you very much for your support in the past and in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for being here. It's such a great organization. It means so much to so many. So thank you. Thank you. Hey y'all, uh, my name is Chris Garcia and I live on 17th Avenue here in Evans um, as a lifelong Northern Coloradan, as a 25 year resident of Evans and a proud Mexican American. I just wanna say I'm like so proud that y'all did this today. Um, and as part of this, I think that it's so important for us to acknowledge the importance of the census and that we're almost done with the census count. And it's so important for, especially our Hispanic Latino community to be counted. And so I just wanna say like if, Wherever this is being broadcast, get counted. If we don't count, 
we don't get counted, we don't matter. Si no nos cuentan, no nos cuenta, no contamos. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes for a city council on any item not on the agenda this evening? City clerk, is there anyone virtually? Thank you. Next item on the agenda is consent to, that doesn't mean there's no one virtually. That means there's no one wanted to comment. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is consent agenda. Item A, approval of the September 1st, 2020 City Council meeting minutes. Item B, consideration of amendment to the intergovernmental agreement for the, oh, excuse me, let me skip back one. Are there any changes to the agenda? Mr. Mayor, I do have one. If, uh, if staff would request that we might handle that item uh, for the number, the IGA with the school districts. Item A. Since our, our guests are here. Before all business. Um, in this case, yes, Mayor. Okay. Are there any other changes to the agenda? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion. I move to approve the agenda as amended. I second. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion passes. Consent agenda, approval of the September 1st, 2020 City Council meeting minutes. And a B, consideration of the amendment to the intergovernmental agreement for conduct of the Community Development Block Grant Program in Weld County between the County of Weld and the City of Evans. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion passes. We'll go to item nine, new business item A. Consideration of an intergovernmental agreement with the Weld County District 6 concerning land and dedication or payments in lieu for school purposes. And we'll hear from staff. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, members of the council. Uh, at your last meeting during your work session, uh, the council held a rather uh, comprehensive work session with presentation from a, a representative of the Creeley Evans School District about a, a new proposal, a policy that would uh, generate funds from development as it's occurring for new schools, uh, schools are required to serve that, that development. Um, this policy would be known as the land dedication and fee and loose and fee and loo fee system. Um, we have other fees in our city that we know as, as impact fees. This would act very similarly. Uh, council heard, just for the record, mentioned an extensive uh, presentation about the analysis that is so important when uh, comprising those or compiling those impact fees um, and also the purpose for how this would be used, how this money would be used, and also how it's different from some other recent funding initiatives from the uh, school district like the the levy override and a bond measure that was, that was passed. Um, this would actually meet future needs of, of for development that certainly would serve Evans as Evans continues to grow. Uh, staff's comment on this impact fee is that it, it does um, certainly meet a muster of we know impact fees and the, the, the level of analysis and scrutiny that needs to go into appropriately constructed impact fees. Um, and it, as I said, as, as Evans continues to grow, we will certainly need schools, and this fee will uh, will help the school district plan for and construct those schools when they're needed. Uh, so this evening, the next step would be to approve an intergovernmental agreement that governs how the fee would actually uh, be managed day in, day out, how the fee would be set, how the city would agree that we would pass through, we would collect and pass through the funds paid by developers as the fee is uh, collected. And um, with that, Mayor, that, that concludes that. Hey, thank you, Jim. And I do see Dr. Pilch from the school district here. Would you like to talk to us a little bit more about this? Thank you so much, Mayor um, and, and council members. Thank you for having us. Mr. Becklenburg, um, this is really an exciting opportunity, I think, for the city of Evans and for District 6. Uh, this is my sixth year in the school district. And when I came to the district um, and I saw that we were significantly over capacity in almost every school in the district, um, I began asking the question about where are our future school sites? Because most districts work with their local municipalities and developers to plan for future school sites. 
and we did not have any future school sites. We did have the old John Evans site because we had just built the new Prairie Heights Middle School um, here in Evans, and so we had that old site, and we knew, and we know that someday we will probably build another school on that John Evans site. Um, but to not have land um, acquired well before the need for the actual building is um, is a significant oversight on the part of of a school district and the community, and so. Some of the work that we've done, and uh, one of our school board members is here tonight, Ms. Solis, some of the work that we have done has been this facility master plan work. And we've identified um, the needs in Greeley and Evans, both, um, in within the school district boundary. That led to the bond issue that just passed this past fall. Um, and it developed, um, a t we developed a 10-year plan. Um, Mayor, I think you were part of those meetings with us and developing this this ten year um, plan of, of what we would expect here in the school district. And so we know um, in the decade or decades to come that we will need additional schools here in Evans. We hope to build a high school here one day. I don't know if I'll still be here in ten years to to get to see that, but but what I do know is our current board of education and and staff and I are committed to having a plan. So whoever comes after us. Uh, we have the infrastructure in place. So uh, we're not, I mean, when we went to build this, try to find a place to build this new K-8 in our bond issue, um, and we knew we needed that K-8 in, in Greeley because the, the greatest overcapacity in K-8 is, is in the city of Greeley, part of the school district. Um, and there was, I mean, there was very little land to be had in Greeley. Fortunately, there is still land to be had in the city of Evans. Um, and we we have been talking um, with with landowners about purchasing land, and so uh, once we have this in place, these dollars, um, if if you do approve it, these dollars would be able to go toward um, the purchase and development of land for future school sites. And so it's it's an investment in the infrastructure um, here in the city. And uh, you know, I I just want to say I'm I'm so pleased with the relationship that we've been able to develop with the city of Evans and with the school district. And I know that relationship. Was was not always there. Um, and I also want to say that, uh, you know, although I stood in front of the city council in Greeley um, here a couple months ago with a similar plea, uh, District 6 will benefit far more from the city of Evans approving this than from the city of Greeley approving it. That's, that's just the frank truth. Um, that agreement will benefit Windsor more than it will benefit um, our school district. This tonight will benefit our school district and will impact children really for decades to come. And uh, we're excited that uh, about the possibility of a high school here again one day. We know that we're going to need another elementary school or a K-8. Um, Centennial Elementary, Dos Rios, Chapelo, um, Hyman are all well over capacity. We are doing a significant addition at Chapelo K-8 with this bond issue. So that will help us with some of our capacity issues at Chapelo K-8. Um, but you're going to need another K-8 over here in Evans. And you're going to need, I think it's a small high school, but you're going to need a high school. So um, I, I thank you for letting us come before you. And um, I ask you for your support in this. Our Board of Education did vote unanimously last night to approve this. Um, and I also want to uh, show that I understand uh, the impact on developers and, and homeowners when you do an, uh, an impact fee. I understand that. I'm not naive to that. And, um, and it's a part of, of our obligation in, in preparing schools for the future for students to come. So thank you for having me tonight. I have uh, Kent Henson, my brain, with me, um, <laughs> who, who has really been the work behind all of this, um, along with, with the city staff, and, and thank you. Uh, for the work with it. So thank you for having me, Mayor. Thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> questions of our staff of Dr. Pilch or Mr. Henson? No questions, but uh, she had me at high school in Evans. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment. So I was a part of the design advisory group at McAuliffe, and I definitely, the first thing I was like, oh my goodness, did we not address growth? Because, um, we're, the school is doubling in size, but it was only to keep the students within the school. So just to bring them out of the right. portables. And so I was like, and then I started really thinking about everything. And so I realized when you go out to acquire a bond, um, you, you always have to be conservative about it. And I kind of related it to our ballot measure that we had. You know, we had people state, well, why didn't you go 
at, what do you do at 4%? That would be nice in retrospect, but is it something that will pass? And so, yes, there is definitely a need for a K-8. Um, there's definitely a need for high schools. Um, I think that the way the design group, how they utilize the space, it was phenomenal. And the, and the way they interacted with everyone. I mean, I was there in the advisory group as a parent. And so I was just amazed by it all and the process. And I, again, echo uh, the mayor pro I'm excited. You had me at schools in Evans, and we do have the land for it, which is amazing. And the simple fact that everyone in our surrounding cities can benefit from it is also great. So thank you for the work that you all do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for serving on that committee. You're welcome. Any other questions of our group? I'll, I'll flip the script here. <clears throat> I wasn't a, a proponent of the bond or the mill levy, but um, this impact fee actually makes sense. Um, and I was, I was pretty happy to hear that we were going to have the new building support the new school. So um, <clears throat> this is the one thing that I, I can say that I can stand behind and support. So I'm glad we're doing it. Any other questions or comments? Councilmember Neal. Yes, when I came here in, uh, to Greeley to go to college in 1973, uh, uh, Evans had already lost her high school. The school district had closed that. And I know that, uh, I'll use the word disappointed, uh, the, <coughs> resident, uh, the longtime residents in Evans were very disappointed. It was closed. Uh, I was here when they closed uh, St. Varane, and I know that uh, there were a lot of people that were disappointed when that happened too. So to hear uh, a means for uh, funding new schools, and, and especially a high school in Evans, yeah, I think it's very encouraging for the, for the uh, people with children in Evans that would like their children to grow up and and go through high school actually in Evans. So, thank so you. Council Member Neal, when uh, we go for that bond for that new high school, I'll have you talk about that, about the importance of going for that bond for that new high school. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions or comments? I don't have any questions, but I do have a comment. Uh, I am a huge supporter of District 6. Uh, I've lived in Greeley for 20 years, I think. I came here for college many, many, many moons ago. Um, <laughs> but when I first came, District 6 wasn't what it was today. And as a woman in this community, I didn't think it was a place I wanted to send my children. Um, since your leadership and the leadership of the board and people like Mr. Henson, we've become a district to truly be proud of. And I think this is such a step in the right direction. Um, as a mom, as somebody deep-rooted in the district today, I think this is really fantastic. You know, I was a huge supporter of the bond measure. I think it was a necessity, and I see the benefit. But I want, what I want the community to understand is your leadership, the leadership from the board, um, and the leadership of those around you have really demonstrated how you are really being so fiscally responsible with the dollars mm -hmm. that the community has entrusted you with, and I appreciate that. I think what I particularly like about this is that it really does lend itself not only to future development of our community, but future development of our children. And as a mother of two, that's huge. Um, I am so proud to have both my boys in District 6 this is the first year. They're both there. Um, and I'm just so proud, and I'm so proud of this. I think this measure is great, and I hope the community sees the value in it. Uh, I certainly see the value in it, and I look forward to what the future holds because of this. So thank you very much for your leadership there. Thank you for your support. And I just want to echo, I'm 100% in favor of this. I think growth should always pay its way, and we need the new schools, and the people moving here should be the ones paying for it. I want to touch a little bit on something you said when you said the relationship between Evans and the school district. I want to thank you for that. That was one of the things I really wanted to work on when I even got on this council. I've been a coach in your school district for 21 years. Mm -hmm. And in 21 years, all I ever heard was Greeley schools and Greeley schools and Greeley schools and Greeley schools. And ever since you and Mr. Henson and your 
staff have come on, all I hear is Greeley Evans School District. And Greeley Evans, we're actually included in that now. And that means a lot to us here in Evans. I know we're not as big as Greeley, but we're just as important. So thank you just as much as you thanked us for that relationship. It is fantastic. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mayor. If there's no other discussion or comments, I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the intergovernmental agreement with Weld County School District 6 and authorize the mayor's signature on the agreement. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the intergovernmental agreement with Weld County School District 6 and authorize the mayor's signature on the agreement. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion passes. Thank you guys again very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we're going to go back to old business item A, public hearing, consideration of ordinance number 727-20, an ordinance repealing and replacing chapter 18, section 18.07.120, plot modifications, replots, vacations, and lot line adjustments to clarify application material requirements, criteria for approval, and processing standards in the city of Evans. I will open the public hearing and hear from staff. The Community Development Department has an ongoing initiative of working through our code and taking sections and trying to make sure that they are as clear and user intuitive and friendly as they can be, um, especially for those sections of the code that are most used by our homeowners and less sophisticated developers. The item that you're considering this evening falls into that category. Um, flat modifications like replats, vacations of easements and rights of way, lot line adjustments, things like that are people are things that the people need to do from time to time to improve their properties or do what are often relatively small projects or larger projects. And uh, we've certainly heard some feedback that our code could be clearer um, and kind of more intuitive. So um, our community development director, A.F.S. Johnson, has led an, an effort uh, to work first at the staff level and then at your, your planning commission who, re who reviewed this on their August 25th meeting um, to work through this section of the code uh, that governs plat modifications, replats, vacations, and lot line adjustments. So some technical stuff, but important stuff. Um, to make it more clear and more transparent and hopefully more intuitive for users of the code. So with that, I'll ask uh, Ian to give a brief overview of the, the, uh, the recommended um, changes, and we'll seek your uh, consideration of the ordinances. All right, thank you, Mayor Rudy, members of council, and Jim, for the great introduction. So this is the first reading of the proposed repeal and replacement of section 18.07.120 of the city land use code. So as Jim mentioned, the rationale for the land use code really should be transparent. There should be clear criteria for approval. There should actually be application material requirements. There should um, be a reduction in redundancy and processing time. So as I've been here now nine months full time and a couple years before that part time, it was time to notice what really needed to be changed. What is our what are our most frequent land use applications that are requested? And I am a firm believer that if you don't work in the code, that that um, you should just make it straight, as streamlined as possible. Um, and, and I didn't want to change it until we had worked with it for a while to know what those kinks are. So again, the rationale is streamlined consolidation, create a, a transparent process, and eliminate redundancy. For example, right now, um, the minor, some of the minor replat processes Say to follow the final plot process, which requires an ordinance. However, the minor replat process, uh, in some instances, asks for a resolution. So sometimes you see us bring forth a replat, and it's in an ordinance and a resolution. So we're, we're just proposing to eliminate some redundancy there. 
And the sections that are up for reconsol we're rearranging and reconsolidating. So section, um, the first section, will, there's no changes that are proposed in the language. It's just moving the intent into that opening section. The next section is the pre-application conferences, expectations, and outcomes. There really aren't a lot of changes there. However, we wanted to just clarify what staff's role was, what the applicant's role was, and that we're there to help. The next section that the application process is actually defined, and there are types of applications that will be administratively approved, and those are outlined. Then the next section requires, um, there are some processes that really do require coming before you for um, a land use hearing. Similar, and then similarly, the final plat process will be referenced, but no changes are being proposed. The next section does provide a list of applications submitted for requirements, and the following section actually provides some criteria for approval. Again, we're going for the expected outcome by listing application requirements, by listing what that criteria for approval are, people are then guaranteed a process. We can't guarantee them the end, but we can guarantee them a transparent and, and certain process. And then the final section provides doc direction on how the document will be reported, and there are no changes to that. So again, doing a little bit of reorganization, adding in some criteria for approval, a few application requirements, but really it's just reorganization. Thank you. <laughs> the public hearing, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this item? Is there anyone online? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in opposition of this issue? Assuming none online again. Questions that need to be answered by council of staff. I have none. I have none. Seeing no questions, I will close the public hearing. Council discussion. I think this is pretty straightforward. I mean, anytime that we can clarify our code or simplify it to make uh, business, um, you know, use of it a lot better, I'm in favor of. Any other discussion? Well, I just want to say thank you for. <clears throat> I want to thank staff for making these. Um, procedures a little bit more clearer for people coming in. I've always um, proclaimed that we should be uh, user friendly and if it makes uh, it easier for people to come in and um, work with the city, I am very excited to see this. Thank you. Thank you. I also agree. Anything for clarity, I am for. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing no other discussion, I didn't see a motion. I move to approve ordinance 727-20. Second. A motion and a second to approve ordinance number 727-20. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion passes. Item B, consideration of approval of the development agreement for the extraction T-bone oil and gas facility. We'll hear from staff. Thank you, Mayor. Approximately a year ago now, not quite that long, but almost a year ago, the council approved a special use permit for extraction of this project on the T-Bone oil and gas facility. Uh, this project site is located uh, northwest of the intersection of 37th Street and 47th Avenue. Uh, the final step in the process includes the development agreement with the city. This is step we're asking you to consider approving seeking, and I'll turn over to the Community Development Director, Ann Bess Johnson, for a summary of the development agreement. And we'll ask for your consideration of the agreement. Thank you, Jim, and, and Mayor, and members of the council. Um, just a reminder, Jim did point out where the location of this facility will be. And then, if you remember, um, this is the proposed facility itself with the wells and some of the infrastructure that support the wells. This will be a, a facility that will be pipelined supported so there won't be very many trucks on the road once it is constructed and then around the pad itself we have some landscaping and berming and um, Scott Sandridge and Efren um, Rodriguez really did 
um, give this a good scrutinizing um, review of this application and the applicant was willing to comply with, with the additional burning and landscaping. So that goes over the intent of the use and of course those items are covered in the improvements agreement themselves. Um, this was a standard improvements agreement and I know that city attorney Krog spent a lot of time with the applicants um, and their counsel just to reassure them of the intent of our development agreement. And it is a standard warranty of 115% and then post release, it will be released down to that 15% for two years. A surety bond will be posted prior to the issuance of a grading permit. So normally you would ask for a surety or a letter of credit or a bond at this point in time, but due to the oil and gas production, um, we're just letting them know that they will need to post a surety prior to getting a grading permit. Um, the developer will be responsible for on-site drainage, paying cash in lieu of sidewalk construction for the frontage along 47th Avenue and 37th Street in the amount of about $90,000. And again, that is timed at the time for when a grading permit needs to be pulled, that's when they would pay that fee. They will also be paying about $120,000 for street lights along both roads, and that will be paid at the time of grading permit as well. There will be access improvements um, for the approved special use permit plan, and there will be landscaping improvements and maintenance that will also be in the letter of credit or the bond the surety payment um, made. So those were the only other items um, that are, that are you know, outside the normal template, and then we add in the site-specific items. And Scott, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything about the negotiations with the contractor. Well, I'm glad they're over. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that both parties ended up where you know they could live with, and uh, uh, and put a lot of time into this, and and it's good to get it concluded. Thank you. Questions of staff? I do. Go ahead. We are requiring them to put landscaping and sidewalks in on 47th and 37th and lighting where we're intending to expand both those roads and add a roundabout. So why are we requiring them to do that only to be torn up? They actually have council here. Thank you for that. That's a great question. They actually dedicated additional right-of-way for us, and all of their improvements are going to be outside the right-of-way, and they are being done in concert with the improvement plans on 37th and 47th. As well. So they're going to have their sidewalk and everything set back with the intention of there's going to be an expansion and a... And exactly. A, okay. And it, and, yeah, and their designs, everything was done with the future plans of 37th and 47th in mind. They're being cash and loose so that they can be paying for those improvements at the same time as our project. Okay, okay so, we, so it'll all coincide there, so nobody is doing double work, <clears throat> uh, laying down cement, concrete, drainage, that is only going to be torn up again when we do that. Exactly. Okay. Extraction was very accommodating to work with um, engineering and operations to make sure that the future plans for the city were incorporated into their plan um, through the special use permit last year. Thank you. I mean, it's nothing more frustrating than seeing something go down, it looks nice, and then a year, two years later, we're ripping it back up we should have planned ahead. So if that's really what's going to happen, then that's a wonderful thing. Thank you. Other comments of staff? Uh, excuse me, questions of staff? That's Member Neal. Yes. Um, apparently, extraction is going through a bankruptcy right now. Scott? Yeah, that, that was one of the issues that we had to address in the development agreement is whether they would need leave from the bankruptcy court in order to do this agreement. If it's an executory contract, then they need to do that if there's money that's going one way or the other. Since this doesn't take effect and they don't pay anything until the grading permit issues, we have an opinion from their attorney that they don't 
need the bankruptcy court's approval. That's what allowed it to move forward. Okay, thank you. Other comments of staff? Or excuse me, questions of staff? I do. I have a quick question. Please. Along the same lines as Councilwoman Spear, on those, um, the access that I know when we first talked about this, and please forgive my lack of like going back in time, uh, but I know there was right in, right out. When they're doing construction, has that been considered as to how the impact of construction and that access will occur simultaneously? Yes, so we would, we of course have encouraged both the COGCC to get this approved um, before construction started because we didn't want those trucks on the roads. However, COGC did not get it approved and they're still in the approval process for their state permit. Um, they did a study of the road conditions approaching the facility before um, submitting their special use permit and um, it will be right in right out only for the construction vehicles but because the intent is for it to be pipeline fed the first the impact really will be during construction but after that there will be very few trucks because again it will be pipeline piped to the destination after and along those same lines, are we concerned about how that might impact traffic flow? I'm not sure how that will work with the potential trucks going in and out of the site plus construction and, and potential limitations to traffic during that time. Well, right now they don't know when they're going to be constructing the pad. And so when we do get information from them on construction, we will definitely be coordinating with Mark Overschmidt and his team and any kind of construction activities that are planned for 47th and 37th, because that will be their all route. 47th south to 37th and then west, and then back north again to US 34. So they've been accommodating to this point, so I can't believe that they wouldn't be accommodating to work with us to minimize the traffic. Wonderful, thank you. Other questions? I have none. Okay, no questions, any comments, discussion? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion. I move to approve the development agreement for the extraction T-bone oil and gas facility and authorize the mayor to sign the development agreement. <coughs> Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the development agreement for the extraction T-bone oil and gas facility and authorize the mayor to sign the development agreement. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion passed. Item C, consideration of resolution 28-2020 to approve the city of Evans purchase of the water rights and water system from Willowbrook Water and Association LLC and related entities. And we'll hear from staff. Thank you, Mayor. This is an opportunity the council has conducted uh, two closed sessions or executive sessions on uh, to uh, give direction to staff re regarding this, this matter. Um, this, this project will ensure that uh, residents of Willowbrook and uh, Prairie View have uh, similar infrastructure for non potable irrigation as other subdivisions with those. Um, those systems do in Evans, and that Evans will be able to influence affordability and availability of uh, that, that non of water. Uh, with that, I will ask our assistant city manager, um, Randy Reedy, to just give a, a brief recap of the project and the agreement for you this evening. Resolution. Council. But before you this evening, is this resolution? And I'd be remiss, uh, I didn't start out by, by saying, first of all, thank you to our assistant city attorney, Simon, who uh, led the negotiation on, on part of the city, and also uh, uh, Mr. Water Association, Mr. Reed, our appreciation to him as well. Um, it was a, a pleasure to do business. It was, it was very helpful to this. this 
Also, uh, our staff, uh, led by Scott Sandwich, improved the due diligence of the pumps in the uh, pumps investigated, uh, making sure that we be using the 18 year old system. Covered is that it's been maintained well. Um, and, uh, operating motors have been in place. It's actually a good thing. 15 20 year lines. And so, slides will continue on. Um, and I have a good deal of knowledge about what we're getting. Of course, there are certain things like electrical systems and what's everything. really don't have a lot of. Uh, Also typical of our, our own uh, cloud systems. For those, you are also familiar with our repair of the these systems. Pump house and the main pumps are the same brand as the ones that we are maintaining. Good deal of knowledge about what this system is. Is, is 10 shares of Hermelian uh, water, a long ridge system. We went into this at, at the council's direction. First attempt to very rigorously to, to get an appraisal for those 10 shares of uh, water. It proved to be very difficult. With water shares, don't train very well. Best estimate that we could get from the appraisal was uh, each share has a value of between 150000 Offer that was uh, presented to the city was for uh, the entire system. Back to them, and so the period arrived at a $1.5 million budget. Happens to be price for the shares of one. Because that's report does go into some some detail about that diligence. We do happy to respond to questions on that, but I won't go into it. I want to highlight some of the financial uh, implications of the one point five million dollar lump sum deal. We did thoroughly investigate All the payments over three years to kind of uh, even out the, the uh, waterfront. However, it would come with the cost of about fifty thousand dollars in interest. So, the, the end of this year, we're projecting a four point four million dollar uh, balance in the waterfront, and so department and uh, lump sum payment. There is a cost recovery component to this, not just a uh, purchase. This is a, does have about two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars worth of uh, revenue coming in each year. Revenue will be growing, growth and revenue continue to grow. So, um, we have built into the program about fifty thousand dollars to increase the uh, workflow system. Into about fifteen fifteen thousand dollars for one by three percent maintenance the other line uh, breaks each year that need to be fixed. We've also built in forty percent of one full time equivalent water equivalent uh, of about thirty five thousand dollars per year uh, for staff. That in mind, uh, the government does generate uh, a small surplus. Uh, anticipated, but we believe that there will, there will be a uh, yeah, I'm happy to respond to any questions, but what before you this evening is a resolution. Resolution. to sign the closing. 
Thank you, Amy. Questions of staff? No questions. Councilmember Neal? Well, I'm going to comment. Uh, I believe that this, this will be an excellent investment and uh, it will probably uh, save the city from a lot of headaches and heartache uh, as we've experienced in the past with the Tuscany uh, non pot system being built out by the developer. And uh, I believe there's one, at least one other uh, private, the semi private uh, non pot system in Evans, which has caused uh, some, some problems in the past. But definitely, uh, I believe, I firmly believe that the, the uh, water system should be under the control of the city rather than. Uh, private individuals or and they should do obviously from the experience of Tuscany they should be the developer should maybe be made to put those in place first before they can start building houses or apartment buildings and selling them. Um, I think this is a very good investment and I, I uh, note that uh, we're planning on on uh, if this is purchased, sending water over to the new uh, Mission Brooks subdivision. So, um, any any way we can uh, improve our non-pot system throughout the city, I think is is great. So I'm very much in favor of this. Any questions of staff? Okay. Any other comments? I do, I do have a comment. Uh, first of all, I think this is a great investment for the city of Evans. Um, this con continued process of the city owning it and continue the non-potable uh, water use in the city is fantastic. So that definitely is a great help for the, not only the residents to use the non-pot, but also you know helps us with not using, going into our cap and using potable water. So I think just for the water shares alone that we're basically paying for it is gonna be a great investment for the city and we'll pay back, you know, 10 times old, you know, in the long run. Mayor Pro Tem, any other comments? I have none. Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion. I move to approve resolution number 28 2020 as proposed. I second. second. I motion and second to approve resolution number 28 2020. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Item D, contribution to Weld County Business Recovery Program. We'll hear from staff. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, several months ago, the uh, city committed to participation in the Weld County CARES Act COVID-19 support uh, funding plan. It's a, a plan by which um, there's federal money available to the city um, through Weld County for COVID-related COVID -related expenses. Um, that money is largely allocated on a per capita basis, and on a per capita basis, Evans' share of that total allocation of Wells County is $974,000. Um, and that, again, the, the two big categories of use for that money are direct COVID expenses reimbursement from the city, so expenses we've had, we've taken on um, to adapt to uh, COVID, so those are reimbursable. At this point, we anticipate those being around $150,000 to $200,000. Um, and then the other uh, category of use for this money is business support for COVID-related re COVID losses and expenses incurred by businesses. So these are, those are the two categories that all municipalities in the county are, are dealing with and are trying to make the most of their, their shares. Um, so, Will County took the initiative along with Upstate Colorado, Economic Development Corporation, which the city is a member, um, full, full, I guess, uh, full disclosure on, on the one board director right now of the African City with Upstate, which is good for this. Um, the Will County and Upstate have, have set up a business recovery program uh, to which the counties. Um, donating at least $1.2 million, and the end it could be closer to $2.5 million that, that could be available to all businesses in the, the county. Um, and then 
uh, probably, well, all municipalities are invited to participate in that program. I understand so far, five to seven municipalities have expressed that they're taking similar actions to the one that this council is, is considering tonight. So um, with that, I'll finish by saying we're, uh, we're uh, requesting council tonight to uh, consider a contribution to this business recovery program in the amount of $75,000 um, that would uh, have priority for coming back to Evans businesses, first of all. Um, and if it's not allocated out to any place, um, it would come back to us uh, if it's not granted out. And all of the, any of this money that is granted out would be reimbursed to Evans through the CARES Act. So there's really a net zero cost to us in the end. We just have to be willing to put the money out first so they can be reimbursed. Uh, with that, our economic development manager, Allison Modig, has been working directly on the program with Upstate Colorado and has been out beating drum with our businesses hopefully get, to get them interested and I've asked her to give a brief overview of the uh, program and the kinds of ways that this funding can help businesses and um, what we're doing to get the word out. Okay. Um, to qualify, there are obviously a few eligibility requirements for businesses that are the most obvious. Uh, they do have to be in business um, before February 1st, 2020, um, to be registered in Colorado and good standing. Requiring them to have 50% of the business, the, um, business has to be owned by a Well County resident, or 50% of the employees have to be well residents, or 50% of the have to be traceable back to Well County. So there's definitely a strong tie to the county. Um, have to demonstrate that they were solvent uh, as of good money after that. Um, there's a requirement in the application process to demonstrate how financial stress or COVID has affected um, operations or led to loss of revenues. Also, of course, you would have costs of having to buy some type of equipment or uh, programs a little bit different too. It's also open to some. The program was purposely um, interpreted as widely as it could be. So, disrupted um, supply networks that have led to critical inventory of two materials. Um, to have uh, employees being ventilation, air conditioning. Tech. Plus revenue is one that is included in the last year. Revenues, rent, mortgage, utilities, hardware, software, touchless contact systems. Yeah. <laughs> really is a wide range of, of items. And then there are some types of businesses that aren't going to be eligible. Hospitals, churches, schools, corporately owned national chains. Drive revenue from gambling. Um, specifically, we're going to use salary and operational savings in the general fund to front for this contribution until we're able to be reimbursed. Hola. This evening, that you uh, contribution to the business recovery program and <coughs> budget amendment to the general. That was it. Thank you. I have two questions. If the business received a PPP loan, does that negate them? So they can't use this loan for the same thing that they use. Okay, so they use PPP for their staff and labor, they could use it for loss of revenues. Perfect. My other second question is 75,000 why? Why not 150, why not 300? If, if we get a total of 900 in staff, 
the city's taking 200 out for its expense and leaves 700 tests. And I understand we have to front the money, long story short. So that would be why, but why 75? Where that number? That's, that's the reason. We have to front the money. We, the, um, <coughs> the idea with Upstate is that they're going to take this, this first round of applications during September right now. And then they'll be able to check back in with the communities and say, hey, Evans, we got, you know, $150,000 of applications. Um, do you want to contribute any more? Um, we might say yes, but we might say, well, we're going to hold off because there's a whole lot of county, county money. Uh, allocation yeah. that everyone's anticipating might be available to, large, to the whole county. Sure. Um, so I think we're being cautious. We've certainly signaled to upstate that if there is a large interest from Evans businesses that, you know, I've said that I think our council would be willing to help as much as we can. Uh, since it's all going to be reimbursed, but we also don't know if there will be interest or if there will sure. be applications. So this is just our first estimate of what that need might be. And the county uh, has has suggested that to be part of to have access to the rest of the, the county money that they would like to see municipalities in for about 15 percent of what's of the first half of what's been allocated. Okay. Which this this beats. So it's a, a cautious first step, acknowledging that we are putting our money out. And we don't want to put out more than we need to. Perfect. Thank you. Other questions of staff? That's my deal. Is uh, staff going to reach out to the businesses again and, and notify them that this is a new uh, program? And I think the messaging is a little complicated because I think businesses have heard a lot about a lot of programs, mm -hmm. and so we're going to we're going to put together an actual direct call campaign of our larger businesses, our taxpayers. We'll kind of figure out what things we need. Yeah. And we'll use social media. We've done a couple of newsletters already. So I, I mentioned this to one business in Greeley that um, their daughter has a business in Evans, and um, she's been kind of discouraged by, you know, trying to fill out things and uh, not getting much in return. So, well, well, I th there's three restaurants I think that are, are kind of hurting in Evans. Uh, they're on 23rd Avenue, and that's Chili Thai, Romas, and and uh, Palomino, it's like we could certainly use the information, I'm sure. Other questions of staff? I guess also, my question would be the last time we did the outreach for the businesses, were, how receptive were they of the information? And did they um, get out there and apply? Do we have a number of the amount of businesses that did apply for the, um, for the PPP or any of the? Um, Really really yeah, 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 for that program. Just because I, I, so I would love to know what that looks like in an effort to change how we do our outreach this time around. Because if we in essence do the same thing, it's not going to work. And I think also a lot of the, the businesses, I know they had mentioned um, how difficult it was to do all the paperwork and some people just did not understand it. And then it gets to the point where you're so frustrated already with everything that's happening to add that burden of frustration. For some people, they're you know what, forget it. I'm just not going to go there. So in addition to just outreach and calling them, letting them know what, what that looks like, also having in place um, information for the businesses to go somewhere so they can uh, to facilitate the process for them would be advantageous as well. Because, again, we're trying to, facilitate things for our businesses, not add a hindrance or a burden to them in these times. But I think they got to fill out all that. I mean, they're getting free money. So I would never look at it as a burden if they had to fill out a bunch of forms or figure out how to fill out free money. money. Well, because I think some of the businesses were small um, that they had to do the PP um, uh, e first in effort to get certain grants. And so, and then they weren't eligible for that because of their capacity. And then they were going through the process, and then it became such a like a issue for them that it eventually they, it just stayed. The, the, the application was never um, filled up to its completion because of all the nuances. And so, I just want to ensure that the smaller businesses that were able to um, to acquire these um, grants 
understand that it, it looks different. And again, it's just breaking it down in women's terms for them because sometimes that's what people need. And some of the people that do own businesses that are smaller, sometimes there's even a language barrier there. And so for them, it's just, you know, they just look at all the, the verbiage and it's just, it's a lot. So just to be kind of, you know, sensitive to that as well. Uh, probably two of the points to make. I think we, we did hear that the, the first grant program had a lot of requirements yeah. in terms of paperwork, uh, financial statements. Upstate, this, for this particular program, tried to simplify it as much as we could. Um, and then we're, I'm, certainly I have made it clear that anyone who has any questions about the application process, so long as they contact me directly, and I'll be happy to walk them. And I did hear that they were trying to kind of alleviate that situation for um, this round, which is actually really good. Um, but I just hope that, again, with the prior experiences, it just wouldn't, uh, people would, would not pursue them. Yeah, we don't want to discourage people. Yeah. We, want, we want to get that money out. Right. Other comments? I think from my perspective, I really support this. I appreciate the uh, question from Mayor Rudy on why not more, and I appreciate that there's an ability in the, in the future to do more. Uh, I think an important thing for everybody to know is this: that CARES money is coming from the state. And so, yes, there are sometimes burdens some hoops, but it's for the good of the taxpayers. Um, so from a financial perspective, I look at it and go, gosh, Trust me, I fill out like 10 million <laughs> grant applications for this, yeah. but um, for the good of the order, right? And yeah. so I think one thing I would say, one thing that helped when I was going through it, um, Dola did a really good job having a video that just walked you through the process, and it was very helpful. So the first time I did it, I could go to that video and literally kind of click through, okay, yeah, I got this, yes, I, oh, no, I don't really need this information. I think if we could do something like that, first of all, it saves you the time of having to go through it 10,000 times with different people, but I think it also helps to add that clarity um, for businesses. So if we can help to provide some of that clarity uh, while understanding the need for those documents, I think that would be advantageous. So. And if we can get that clarity also and it's in Spanish, it would be definitely helpful. Because again, you can, there can be a video and it's in English, it's not going to do any good for the person if they're not English speaking. So I, that's just, I just want to facilitate things for the community. Other comments? Hearing none, I entertain a motion. I move to approve the $75,000 contribution to the Wealth County Business Recovery Program and approve a preliminary budget amendment to the general fund in the amount of $75,000 to be transferred from other general fund accounts where savings is anticipated. Second. A motion second to approve the $75,000 contribution to the Weld County Businesses Recovery Program and approve the preliminary budget amendments to the general fund in the amount of $75,000 to be transferred from other general fund accounts where savings is anticipated. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Next item, item E, consideration of award of contract for master plan update. We will hear from staff. Thank you, Mayor. I know the council has heard, uh, you know, probably in each agenda, you're even you're either approving a funding source, a grant, or a contract <coughs> for the master plan or the transportation uh, master plan, which are related but separate projects. So I believe this is our final Consultant contract for the project? Yes. <laughs> well, it's good work. I'll just, before uh, to turn it over to Anne for just a very brief overview of this work, I'll just uh, remind council that this is the one where, where we have a 50% match from DOLA for $80,000 of work, uh, with the rest coming from the city. So, again, we're getting a lot of work done as part of our master planning process and our long term planning. Um, for very well leveraged uh, city funding. With that, I'll turn it over to um, Ann Best Johnson for a brief overview of the work and the process for arriving at this consultant. And uh, we'll go from there. 
Thank you, Mayor Rudy. Um, we did an extensive review um, to select our master planning consultant. This is, this is a big project and it sets the stage for Evans and how Evans is going to grow over the next 10 years until our next update. So the significance of this award is, is quite big as well. Um, we had a, a mandatory pre-application meeting, um, eight firms attend that. Then received applications from four firms. Three were selected to interview. Two were the top tier. References were called. We reviewed past similar plans that they had um, created. We called those communities to find out were they on budget, were they on schedule, did they do a lot of change orders, did they do a lot of scope creep. All of those things that are important to the city and um, our, our gut instinct with Ayers and Associates was spot on with the glowing remarks provided by their um, references as well as the communities and then we went above to check references on for where they actually perform work. And they are using group policy research and Gold Evans to help on uh, the community outreach Group does a lot of work in Denver with um, different cultures, different um, community groups, and so they also got a reference check and came out glowing with, with their references as well. So um, the scope of work it was provided, and that concludes my statement on on errors. I guess that that's the process, but I didn't really talk about Ayers Associates. They have a team member that used to be the planner in Cheyenne. He currently does a lot of economic development for the town of Windsor, other communities along the 85 corridor. They also have another individual who's an economic development, their former economic development director for the city of Loveland. So um, we did have Allison on our selection committee. Um, Randy, Lauren, and myself, and um, they're just excited to be being presented this evening to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Questions of staff? No question. Yeah. How involved is, well, the staff going to be with this? And then also, how involved is City Council going to be with this? My point being, are we hiring someone to do a master plan? like we have in the past, where some of the things on the master plan that they have come up with maybe aren't mm, the most feasible to the community. I would hate to see spending money on this. I know it, we have to do it and everything, but I, don't, I guess I don't want to see a lot of money being spent on frivolous things that will never come to fruition, i.e., Boat dock on the river so people can go canoe in the six inches of water during the summer. You know, I mean, you know, we've also talked about a walkway across over Highway 85 from, for what reason? I mean, I, I guess I just want to, I just want to know how detailed this is going to be and where our input is going to be. Great question and very logical questions because this is the future of Evans. So one of your first questions is how involved is staff going to be? Staff is going to remain very involved. Um, they are going to be leading it. However, they're going to be leading it in tandem with staff. So they're not going to go rogue. There will not be that opportunity. Also, members of city council are on the steering committee. Um, Mayor Rudy and Councilwoman Mortensen are on the steering committee. Two members of the planning commission are on the steering committee. Ted Hedgeson's on the steering committee. And then a member of the public at large are on the steering committee. So we will keep them in check. Okay, thank and you. I like boat docks. <laughs> well, well or, <laughs> docks for flying cars or something, you know. Oh, I mean, you. <laughs> no, you have to learn. Tell them Other questions of staff? I have none. Other comments? 
I, I just want to say for me, Miss Ann has a lot of knowledge. And it, I, I see how many fingers are in these pies and how much work and how much she watches over. Just in the few weeks I've been working with her on the steering committee and holy hammer. So thank you, Miss Ann. That's a lot. <laughs> but thank you for all your hard work. Well, you're doing a great job in those meetings, too, by the way. I had some, you know, family stuff this week, so I didn't make this week's, but um, you're doing a great job with that. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I have to say that conversations we kind of had on the sidelines in regards to this, I just appreciate your enthusiasm <clears throat> as well as all the, you know, attention that you place on this. I really appreciate that because that is very important. And your excitement gets me excited. And the ideas that you <laughs> mentioned, I was excited about. And I wanted to hear more. I even said, hey, Mayor Rudy or even Tamara Hazard, let me know because I'll be there. I just, because I mean, it's that interesting to me to hear like what you're doing. And so I get excited. So again, if ever there's anything fun or like, not that it is not all fun, but anything that's, you know, that you feel like we can definitely benefit from, let us know. But I do want to say I do agree with your comment, Laura. I do think, you know, we got to stay focused on it. We can't be looking at things that are just never going to happen. Yeah, I mean, we so paid, I, for, I we paid for it before we have, where we have you know. things that are just never. And, and if they were to <clears throat> happen, it would not serve a lot of people, you sure. know. So sure. I just don't want to be wasting money again on another Jim? Yeah. I'll just comment to add in some comments about council oh, and wall. Spot. We do have um, updates for council at work sessions planned, um, you know, monthly or bi-monthly, so that you can hear what's happening at the, the steering committee. Uh, your colleagues can fill you in on some context. We can kind of check on, make sure we're headed in the right direction with some of the uh, concepts and the the findings that that uh, committee has so that we can keep the Council Planning Commission and the Master Plan Steering Committee all marching forward together on this, this project. So you will be seeing more of, more of those work session updates. Well, and the other thing I just really appreciate, I mean, I, I said Council involvement, and we do have two um, very good people that are helping out along with the very good people that are helping out on that end. So that makes it um, uh, a lot more, what do I want to say, uh, it's a bigger relief knowing that there is involvement instead of some outside person who might not know exactly what the city and the citizens, you know, are needing come in and say, these are, this is what you need. And here's the design. And we all look at it and kind of have to just go with it because we paid for it, you know? So I appreciate that. You guys being involved, it's, it's a lot of time. <laughs> I understand you. I mean, you have valid questions, and I do appreciate you bringing those up. Any other comments? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion. I move to award the master plan update contract to heirs and associates in the amount not to exceed $160,000 and authorize the mayor to execute the contract. I second. A motion is second to award the master plan update contract to heirs and associates in the amount not to exceed $160,000 and authorize the mayor to execute the contract. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 10, report city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Just one brief thing. I'll note that uh, there's a report at your diet tonight. This is the second uh, will be monthly report. Our capital project status update that uh, outlines um, the, uh, the description of each project, status, next milestone, cost, and estimated completion date for all of our largest projects. It also includes a list of completed projects, and it also includes the information requested by Councilmember Johnson the first time this was presented regarding scheduled completion, total cost. Thank you. I, I appreciate this. I just see this, and this is great. Exactly what I asked. Thank you. City Attorney. 
Uh, we have the uh, CML Attorneys Conference coming up in October, and just proving that city attorneys really don't have a life. It's going to be every Friday afternoon for four weeks in a row. So that's what we'll be doing on Friday afternoons. Um, <clears throat> other than that, we've got an executive session, so I'll save the comments for that. Okay, thank you. Next item on the agenda is audience participation. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to the city council on any item? Now, is there anyone online? Before we get to the executive session, Jim, I should do this more often, but tonight in particular, you and your entire staff, I love that they were here for the presentation of the budget, nailed every question the city the council had to ask you guys tonight. IT was perfect. You guys did a perfect job tonight. So I just want to thank you and your entire city staff. It was awesome. Big credit to our important staff over here. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, I called you guys IT, but I was pointing to this stuff. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is executive session. I move to go into executive session to receive legal advice from the city attorney regarding law enforcement and licensing of hotels uh, for section CRS 24-6-402, section 4, subsection B. Okay. Second. The motion is second to go into executive session. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those nay. Passes. passes. We'll go into executive session. Be a second. Yeah, take it. Sessions for how much Fired away. <clears throat> oh, I do. Yeah. I, that's why I was wearing a sweater. <laughs> you were uh, I wasn't bad. I was just like, oh my god. <laughs> 